Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's been a little while. Yeah. Shabbat Shalom. Yeah. Shabbat. Welcome to Adon Alam Messianic Congregation. We're going to go ahead and get started with our services this evening. We hope uh, that you have had a great week. Uh, we want you to know that as a Messianic Jewish congregation, we are here to uh, proclaim the Jewishness of our Messiah and the Jewishness of our New Covenant faith. And one of the ways that we do that is by using Hebrew in some of our songs and prayers, but we will translate the Hebrew because we see ourselves as a community. Uh, the one new man that Rabbi Shaul, the Apostle Paul, talked about in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, Jew and Gentile coming together to worship as one. And so um, we also uh, see our meeting at this time as really a divine appointment with the creator of the universe, as he, as he has told us, uh, to take time each week. Uh, and, and he has set up this appointment to meet with his people. So we trust uh, that this service will be a blessing to you as we come together for this weekly divine appointment. As we uh, begin our service, I'm going to call up Janiel Scott to usher in the Sabbath with the uh, lighting of the Sabbath candles. Uh, Often you will, we will have two candles that are lit uh, at this time because we are given two primary instructions regarding the Sabbath and the scriptures. We are to shamor, to keep or guard or observe the Sabbath, and we are to zakur, to remember the Sabbath, l'chad shev, to keep it holy. Thank you, Janiel. And at this time, I'm going to call up our cantor for the evening, Fred Scott, and ask you to please stand as we will be chanting the prayer known as the Shema. Uh, this prayer is based on Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. And in this prayer, once again, as a community, uh, we affirm the oneness, the uniqueness of our God. Yeshua referred to the first line of the Shema as the greatest commandment. We'll chant the prayer in Hebrew and then recite the English translation, followed by the verses that come afterwards in Deuteronomy 6. Together, the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Blessed be his glorious name, whose kingdom is forever and ever. The Ahavta e Adonai Elohecha. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your, to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Uh, as we get ready to open our service in prayer, it just dawned on me, so I'll share this uh, with you. Um, do you know which direction most synagogues are built facing? That's kind of interesting grammar, but you, you have four choices. East. I hear a lot of people saying east. 
Well, east in this building is actually directly behind us. So if we were going to face east, and the reason it's facing east is because that's where Jerusalem is. But in our new building, guess which way the sanctuary faces? East. East. We will be facing east. Um, so that, just more reasons to be excited about uh, our future move, and hopefully that encourages you as we uh, will mention in the announcements that we're uh, getting close to getting our certificate of occupancy, but we've still got a few things we have to do and we may need some brawn to do it. All right, uh, let's just go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to bless this time. Eloheinu velohava tenu elohiharaham elohei tzakak velohei yaakov. Our God and God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. Lord, we just come together this evening, Lord, for your purposes. Uh, Lord, as we ask you to speak to our hearts, to open our eyes to see what you would have us to see, to open our ears to hear, Lord, uh, what we need to hear from you, and to open our hearts, Lord, to receive from you this night. Uh, as we ask you to bless all who are here, and we ask you to bless our Jewish people gathered in synagogues around the world, that uh, in the portions they study, that they would see the revelation of Yeshua as the Messiah. We ask you to bless our people in Israel, Lord, as they are in the midst of a war of survival, Lord. Their enemies seek their utter destruction, but we know, Lord, you are able to provide the victory, and we pray that the leaders of that land would just trust in you. Uh, we pray that you would give us the leaders in our land that you want us to have and not the leaders that we deserve necessarily. And Lord, uh, we pray for even the miracle that it would take to bring the hostages home safely. And Lord, we just uh, pray that you would use this service for your purposes. Uh, that if there are some here who need a touch from you, Lord, uh, whether it's physical, relational, whatever it might be, Lord, you are able, financial, you are able to meet that need. You are able to supernaturally provide that touch. And Lord, we seek your anointing on this service, uh, that your ruach, your spirit, uh, would move on the singing, the dancing, the worship, the praise, the message, the liturgy, the fellowship time afterwards. Lord, all that we do this evening, we dedicate it to you. And we ask these things in our Messiah Yeshua's name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And now I'm going to call up Linda Lewis to bring us our announcements for the week. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. And welcome to Adon Alam Messianic Congregation. If you are a first time visitor, please raise your hand so that we might recognize you. If you have not yet received a visitor's packet, please keep your hand raised so we may get one to you. Okay, so you already have a visitor's packet. That's wonderful. This Sunday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., we will have a work day at the new building. Efforts will be primarily to move furniture out of the sanctuary in preparation for adding carpet there. We will also be working on the grounds, hopefully before it gets too hot. This Tuesday, we will continue our class on a messianic approach to the Book of Romans. We will just start going through the book verse by verse. All are welcome. And now we pray the Lord's blessings upon you and hope that you will feel his sweet, sweet spirit as you worship with us. Once again, Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, Linda. Now we will be uh, chanting the uh, traditional prayer known as the Vishamru, which means, and they shall keep. This prayer is from Shemot, Exodus 31, verses 16 and 17. We will chant the Hebrew of those verses, and then we will have the English translation with a messianic paragraph that we have added at the end. Together, the Vishamru. Vishamru, Thank you. 
Israel, O he leolam, O he leolam, the shamru the ney Israel, et hashabat, la sod et hashabat, le doratam barito am, ki sheshet yamim. The children of Israel shall keep the Shabbat to observe it throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he ceased from work and rested. And we know our Messiah Yeshua observed the Shabbat. In the New Covenant Scriptures we are told, as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Amen. Amen. Now we are going to enter into the scripture portion of our service. I will call forward our ARC opener, Jeremy Keelan, as well as David Lewis, Lewis, who will be leading us in this portion of the service. And we would ask you to please stand as the ARC is opened. The Ark is the traditional name for the furniture that houses the scroll known as the Torah, which contains the first five books of the Bible, known uh, called by the Jewish people the five books of Moses. And the term Ark also reminds us of the Ark of the Covenant or the Ark of the Testimony, where the presence of the Lord dwelt. And it came to pass, whenever the ark went forward, Moses would say, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. May those who hate you flee from before you. For from Zion shall go forth the Torah, and the word of the Lord out of Jerusalem. Blessed be he who in holiness gave the Torah to his people Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, unique is our God, great is our Lord, holy and revered is his name. Magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Yours, O Lord, the greatness, and the power, and the glory, and the victory, and the majesty, for all that is in the heavens and the earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom, and you are exalted as head over all. Exalt the Lord our God, and worship at his holy mount. For the Lord our God is holy. Amen. I will now ask our scripture readers to come forward. Who, he who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless Randall, son of Yeshua and Michelle, daughter of, of Yeshua, who have come up to honor God and his word. May the Holy One bless them and their families and send blessing and prosperity on all the work of their hands. Amen. Amen. And now for the blessing before the reading of the Torah. Bar-kut-adonai-ham-varach. Bless the Lord who is blessed. Baruch Adonai Hamarach Elam Bless the Lord who is blessed forever and ever. 
Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Pachar Lanu Koh Amin, Benatam Lanu Et Torato, Baruch Atah Adonai, Nosein HaTorah, Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose us from all peoples, and gave us the Torah. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. This is the 28th day of the fourth month on the Hebrew calendar, the month of Tammuz. Our Torah reading for this evening is taken from Numbers 35, 10 through 15. In Hebrew, the name of the book is Bamidbar. We will be reading from chapter 35, verses 10 through 15, on page 193 in the Complete Jewish Bible. I'll be reading from the Complete Jewish Study Bible. Tell the people of Israel, when you cross the Yardin into the land of Canaan, you are to designate for yourselves cities that will be cities of refuge for you, to which anyone who kills someone by mistake can flee. These cities are to be a refuge for you from the dead persons next of kin, who might otherwise avenge his kinsman's death by slaying the killer prior to his standing trial before the community. In regard to the cities you are to give, there are to be six cities of refuge for you. You are to give three cities east of the Yarden and three cities in the land of Kenaan. They will be cities of refuge. These six cities will serve as refuge for the people of Israel as well as for the foreigner and resident alien with them so that anyone who kills someone by mistake may flee there. The blessing following the reading of the Torah. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, asher natan Torah temet, v'chai hinolam natah Baruch atah Adonai, notein ha-Torah, Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and life everlasting planted in our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah, Amen. And now for the congregational response following the reading of the Torah. which Moses placed before the children of Israel. It is in accord with the Lord's command by the hand of Moses. A tree of life it is for those who take hold of it, and blessed are the ones who support it. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. Turn us, O Lord, to you, and let us return. Renew our days as of old. Amen. 
And now for the blessing before the reading of the Haftarah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose good prophets, delighting in their words which were spoken truthfully. Blessed are you, O Lord, who chose the Torah, your servant Moses, your people Israel, and the prophets of truth and righteousness. Amen. Our Haftarah portion for this evening is from Jeremiah 2, 19 through 22. In the Hebrew name, the name of the book is Yirmiyahu Hanavi. We will be reading from chapter 2, verses 19 through 22 on pages 547 in the Complete Jewish Bible. Your own wickedness will correct you. Your own backslidings will convict you. You will know and see how bad and bitter it was to abandon Adonai, our God, and how fear of me is not in you, says Adonai Elohim Sebaot. For long ago I broke your yoke. When I snapped your chains, you said, I won't sin. Yet on a, every high hill, under every green tree, you sprawled and prostituted yourself. But I planted you as a choice vine of seed, fully tested and true. How did you degenerate into a wild vine for me? Even if you scrubbed yourself with soda and plenty of soap, the stain of your guilt is still there before me, says Adonai Elohim. The blessing following the reading of the Haftarah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, rock of all ages, righteous throughout all generations. You are the faithful God, promising and then performing, first speaking, then fulfilling. For all your words are true and righteous. Faithful are you, O Lord our God, and faithful are your words. For no word of yours shall remain unfulfilled. You are a faithful and merciful God and King. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who are faithful in fulfilling your words. Amen. Amen. And now the blessing before the reading of the New Covenant Scriptures. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, Asher natam anu Mashiach Yeshua, Vaharem roshel habrit hacharsha, Baruch atah Adonai, Noten habrit hacharsha. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us Messiah Yeshua and the words of the renewed covenant. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the new covenant. Amen. Our Barit Kaddishah portion for tonight is from Matthew 5, 33 through 37. In the Hebrew name, the name of the book is Matik Yahu Ha Shaliach. We will be reading from chapter 5, verses 33 through 37, on page 1229 in the Complete Jewish Bible. Again, you have heard that our fathers were told, Do not break your oath, and keep your vows to Adonai. But I tell you not to swear at all, not by heaven, because it is God's throne, not by the earth, because it is his footstool, and not by Yerushalayim, because it is the city of the great king. And don't swear by your head, because you can't make a single hair white or black. Just let your yes be a simple yes, and your no a simple no. Anything more than this has its origin in evil. And now the blessing following the reading of the New Covenant Scriptures. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu hadavah hamet, 
Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the word of truth and life everlasting planted in our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the renewed covenant. Amen. When the ark rested, Moses would say, Return, O Lord, to the, myriad, to the myriads of Israel's families. Arise, O Lord, to your resting place, you and your mighty ark. Clothe your priest with righteousness. May those who have experienced your faithful love shout with joy. Hallelujah. For the sake of your servant David, do not delay the return of your Messiah. Blessed, blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who gives us the living word in the Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Amen. When the ark is closed, you may be seated. Please join me in reciting He Being Merciful. He Being Merciful forgives iniquity and does not destroy. Frequently He turns away His anger and does not stir up all His wrath. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving and exceedingly kind to all who call upon you. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The blood of Yeshua, our Messiah, cleanses us from all sin. Now we're going to have all of the children, 11 years old and under, uh, go to a class that we have for you this evening in the fellowship area. And uh, we just pray that the Lord would bless you in that time. And that... Uh, he would reveal his truths even in a way that simple enough for children to be able to understand and actually I hope that that is what I am able to do as well because it's easy to think of our God as being so far above us in terms of uh, understanding when you know everything that's going to be way beyond our understanding. Amen? But the reality is, he wants it to be simple. Uh, he wants us to be able to understand the, the basics uh, of our faith, the reality that <clears throat> our righteousness doesn't come based on our own efforts. What we learn from our own efforts is our inability to be seen as righteous in God's sight. But sometimes we have a zeal, uh, and sometimes it is a zeal for the Lord, and sometimes it's a zeal without knowledge. Uh, last week we talk, talked about Torah portion Pinchas, Phineas in the English, uh, a grandson of Aharon, Aaron, uh, whose zeal caused him to thrust a spear into one of his fellow Israelites, killing a Midianite woman at the same time. And the prophet Balaam, Bilam, was hired to curse Israel, but he was only able to bless God's chosen people. And yet here, he's decided to tempt the men of Israel with pagan women. And according to Numbers 31, verse 16, from this week's Torah portion, because of Bilam's advice, these women caused the Israelites to rebel breaking faith with the Lord. And not only that, resulting in a plague. And it is only the zeal of Pincus, only by his actions has the plague stopped, but only after 24,000 
Israelites had died. And the Lord establishes a covenant of shalom, a covenant of peace with Pinchas, and tells him that the priesthood will belong to him and his descendants from that point forward. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Lord, we just ask you to bless this time as we seek truth from your word, uh, Lord, and we just uh, thank you for your written revelation that provides uh, guidance for our lives, that provides uh, truths that you want us to understand uh, and provides us uh, instruction, Lord, for uh, relating to you, relating to our fellow man, and dealing uh, with the fact that our flesh tends to rebel against you. So, Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight, my rock and my redeemer, asking in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. This week, according to our calendars, we are covering the final two portions in the book of Numbers, the Midbar. The first portion is called Matu which means tribes. And it starts in Numbers 30, verse 2, where the Lord uh, has uh, Moses speaking to the heads of the 12 matot, the 12 tribes. And he's giving them their final instructions as they are making their final preparations to cross the Jordan and enter into the land of promise. The finish line is near, but Moses still feels the need to share some final instructions. So what issue does he address first? Avoiding idolatry, maybe? Nope. Remembering the Sabbath? That seems kind of important, but nope. How about vows and oaths? Yep, vows and oaths. Let's see if we can figure out why. First of all, let's define some terms. A vow is a verbal commitment to the Lord or to someone else. And an oath is a statement that provides assurance that the vow will be kept. And vows can be conditional or unconditional. I like to tell a little story to illustrate a conditional vow. Uh, there's a man uh, who is late for a meeting in a big city. And he's searching for a parking spot, but he cannot find one. So in desperation, he says to the Lord, if you will give me a parking spot in the next minute, I will tithe regularly, I will attend services regularly. Suddenly, just a few feet in front of him, a car backs out of a spot. He looks up and he says to the Lord, never mind, I found one myself. <laughs> this story illustrates how much we tend to interpret things in a way that is favorable to us. Also, how convenient our memory is sometimes. Now, an example of an unconditional vow would be, I promise to love, cherish, and obey for richer, for poorer, in sickness, and in health, till death do us part. Um, <clears throat> that may fam sound somewhat familiar to some of you, uh, a lot easier said than done, uh, but the reality is that's what, uh, how God loves us, unconditionally. Uh, and so um, we will uh, tend to focus more on the unconditional uh, revelations that God gives to us regarding his love and regarding how we are to act one towards another. It used to be that a man's word was his bond. Um, have you ever heard that expression, anybody? And the reason it's a man is because it was a while back that we tend to uh, hear that expression. And it was much more about a, a man's honor in the community. Um, <clears throat> and we'll even see in tonight's portion that uh, sometimes the um, reliability is treated differently for, for a man and a woman. And our society was that way for a long time. I'm not sure it is uh, at this point. Unfortunately, I'm not sure that any person's word uh, is very much their bond, even though that's what we're called to do as believers. But the world today will lie to you in a skinny minute. Uh, they are serving in many ways the father of lies. And sometimes they lied so much they don't even realize that what they're saying is, is a lie uh, anymore at this point. 
um, unless someone has been had a relative eaten by cannibals recently. Anybody? No, okay, we've all managed to avoid that. Um, <clears throat> it used to be if someone said that they would do something, you could count on it happening. And your reputation was based on keeping your commitments. And it takes a long time to build up a good reputation, yet it can be destroyed in just a few seconds of foolishness, a, few, uh, uh, a decision not to keep a commitment that had been made. And we contrast that with the Lord because he fulfills every commitment that he has made. Amen? Amen. Yet the adversary seeks to convince the world that it is God who cannot be trusted to keep his commitments. How does he do this? Well, there's a number of ways, but one interesting way in regard to the Jewish people is his plan A is just wipe them out. No Jewish people, no fulfilled promises. You know, think of Purim, the events of the book of Esther, or Hanukkah. Uh, at these times, we celebrate that we were slated for elimination, uh, and the Lord enabled us to mir uh, miraculously defeat our enemies. Within the last year, we've seen that Satan is able to convince many in this world that we don't deserve to be in the land that the Lord has given to us. Either of these approaches of the enemy suggest the lie that God will not keep his promises to the Jewish people. And I should point out, there are even those in the church world who have bought into that lie. It's called replacement theology. But the reality is, God is true even if every man is a liar. And that's one reason that I'm confident that Israel will not lose this war. The Lord says in Amos chapter 9, verse 15, that once the people have been restored to the land, they will never again be plucked up out of their land. In the New Covenant portion we read earlier, Yeshua talked about oaths. But it's really more about our integrity as believers. He instructs us to keep our vows to the Lord we should not break our promises to the Lord or to anyone else, but we shouldn't have to swear an oath when we make a vow. And specifically, he says that we should not swear by heaven or by earth or by Jerusalem because none of those belong to us anyway. And for that matter, he says we shouldn't even swear by our own heads because we can't make a single hair back black or white, at least back then. Um, <clears throat> For those who color your hair, your secret is safe with me. Uh, <clears throat> the real point that Yeshua is making is that God is in control. Even our own lives are not our own lives. 1 Corinthians 6 verses 19 and 20 says, Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Uh, and that we are not our own? We have been bought with a price. What was that price? the most valuable thing in the universe, the life of the Son of God, the Jewish Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. In Matthew 5, verse 37, Yeshua sums things up, saying simply, when we say yes, it should mean yes. And when we say no, it should mean no. And according to Yeshua, anything more than this can lead to an evil outcome. And speaking of evil outcomes, the rabbis of the Talmud said that the temples were destroyed because of sinat hinam, which means baseless hatred. We're going to talk about in just a few minutes uh, where we are falling on the Hebrew calendar tied to the destructions of, of the temples. According to uh, the, the rabbis, it was a result of baseless hatred. But Yeshua proposes something even more radical in just after the verses that we read tonight in Matthew chapter 5. He proposes baseless love, or what we frequently call unconditional love. In Matthew 5 verse 44, Yeshua tells us, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute us. Today we live in a world full of hate. But we're called to transform this world, to respond in a more excellent way with the way of God's unconditional love. 
Now, how do we do that? Unconditional love doesn't mean just letting someone do anything they want. It means that we choose to act in a way that blesses others despite the possibility that we might suffer as a result. Our flesh is all about protecting ourselves. And we are called to be selfless. We are called to love unconditionally, no matter what the other um, party person, uh, the other person in the relationship does, we are still to love. That just doesn't mean to say love because in Hebrew, uh, the idea of love is an action. Uh, in Hebrew, words reflect our, our actions. Or better, and if we talk about love, our actions have to reflect that. It's not an abstract idea. It's putting other people before our own interests. It's God so loving the world that he gave up his only begotten son. Another example, Dr. Raleigh Washington, who uh, has been a friend of the Messianic movement for many years. Uh, he was a leader in the movement called Promise Keepers. Uh, at the conference uh, last month, he was handing out gold stars uh, for Gentiles who wanted to show their support for the Jewish people, even though they might suffer persecution, even to the point of death being willing to wear that star, to show, uh, as he said, uh, in, in the Holocaust, the Jewish people say never again. He wants these stars to represent never alone. And there's a number of our people uh, that were willing to, to wear the star that made that commitment at the conference. And um, I decided, well, if the Gentiles are gonna stick up for the Jewish people, I probably sh should do it as well. So um, I, I'm wearing one as well. And the only interesting thing was he only gave one at a time. But he said that one of the purposes of wearing it is to find if people see it and ask you about it, to encourage them to do it. So I'm probably going to ask him for uh, a huge supply if we see that we continue to need them. Um, <clears throat> in Numbers 30, we find a dis this discussion about vows. And it seems to be mostly about who was responsible in the Israelite society when a woman made a vow. And to put it simply, it's the man to whose authority she has submitted. If she's an unmarried minor, it's her father. If she's married, it's her husband. Uh, and if the father or husband contested the vow, it would render it invalid. Um, but otherwise, it was valid. And for a widow or divorced woman who was no longer under a man's authority, her vows were immediately valid. And we look at this through modern eyes, and we think, you know, it, it seems kind of unfair. But I would suggest that most of the societies of that time would not allow a woman to make a vow at all. And this was actually a way within that society making it possible for an Israelite woman of that time uh, to be able to make a vow if she chose to do so. And speaking of women in Numbers 31, we find the Lord's instructions to wipe out the Midianite people, men, women, and children, um, <clears throat> because the Midianite women had seduced the Israelites to get them to worship their gods, uh, as we mentioned earlier. And we saw that Bilam was involved in that. Some people question whether he is a uh, good prophet or a false prophet. And I would say that since every description of him uh, after he tries to bless Israel, uh, tries to curse Israel and ends up blessing them is a negative description. Um, I would say that uh, he was not um, following, uh, revealing God's truths in what he was saying. But the military leaders decide uh, that um, that's not exactly how they're going to do things. They're, they'll kill all of the adult men but they're gonna take the Midianite women and children captive. And when Moses finds out, he tells the military leaders to kill all of the remaining males and to keep only the females that have never been with a man. And once again, this seems harsh. Uh, according to Numbers 31, 16, the Midianites have been willing vessels of Balaam, Bilam, but I don't think that's the only reason for this instruction. I also think there's a likelihood that 
if the Midianite boys are seeing their fathers killed, that they will grow up seeking revenge against their attackers. Uh, we see that um, with our Jewish people. Israel has recently made efforts to eliminate the leaders of Hamas. And this is designed to be a deterrence um, to those who think that what Hamas did was something that they would want to do as well. Uh, Israel's going after all of the planners and leaders of the October 7th attacks. And I believe within the last couple of days, they announced uh, three of them that they had killed. And this is the same thing they did with those who planned uh, an operation to take out the, uh, or to take the entire Israeli Olympic team hostage in Munich in 1973. Because the Israelis are not only looking to avenge what happened, but they're hoping to make those who would plan this type of attack think twice as they contemplate what their future will look like as a result. That they and their families will have to continually look over their shoulder and wonder uh, whether or not they are in their, uh, the target of uh, an Israeli sniper. Whether or not when they turn the key in their car that a bomb will have been planted. They're not going to have a moment's peace because Israel will pursue them no matter where they are, no matter how long ago the events occurred, and no matter how long it takes, because they realize their very survival is at stake. If people conclude that they get a positive outcome from pursuing these type of activities. And all too often, especially in recent times, the world is applauding these terrorists, these murderers, these people who target civilians. And then in the ultimate irony, what is their biggest complaint? That Israel's killing civilians that they are using as human shields. Uh, it, it, I'd say, you know, it, it's Mishigas, it, it's craziness. Um, but many people in the world see that as a perfectly reasonable thing um, because they consider uh, Israel is now in the, uh, the guise or in the category of occupier. And once you're in that category, anything the other side does is deemed okay. But we serve a God who tells us that there's a difference between good and evil. And he encourages us to pursue good and to flee from evil. And we have to be ready to call out evil. We, we have to pray for leaders who will call out evil. Uh, in Numbers chapter 32, Moses has another problem because three of the tribes want to settle on the east side of the Jordan River. Um, leadership isn't always all it's cre cracked up to be. Here they are getting ready to go into the promised land. They spent 40 years in the wilderness. Finally, they're getting ready to step into the land of blessing, the land flowing with milk and honey. And what's the next thing that happens? Uh, three of the tribes say, wait a minute, we want to stay over here. So he tells them in Numbers 32, verses 20 through 22, first they have to help defeat the Canaanites, and then they can return to the eastern, eastern side of the Jordan and settle there. So the tribes of Reuben, God and half the tribe of Manasseh, or Gad, as it says in the English, were given land in what is today the nation of Jordan. Now, we should note that when the Israelites begin their conquest of the land of Canaan, they are not taking land that belonged to the Canaanites. They're taking land that the Lord has given to them. The Lord has decided to expel the Canaanites from the land because they've defiled it with their evil actions, including the ultimate evil, offering up their children as sacrifices. And the Lord warns the Israelites, if they copy the Canaanite practices, they're going to be kicked out of the land as well. In Vayikra, Leviticus 18, verse 28, the Lord warns Israel, if you defile the land, it will vomit you out to just as it is vomiting out the nation that was there before you. And Numbers chapter 33 begins the final portion in the book of Numbers called Mas A. Mas A means journeys of, as it's time for the children of Israel to reflect on how the Lord has brought them to this point. The Lord wants his people to realize how far they have come so they'll have confidence in his assurances as they get ready to enter the promised land. Because when they come in, they're not just going to sit there, uh, sit back in an easy chair, put their feet up, 
and just uh, have the glory come pouring on top of them. There are yet significant challenges that they are going to face even in the land of promise, which is encouraging to us. You know, even when we're walking strongly with the Lord, everything in our life doesn't go perfectly right. It just doesn't work that way in this world. Yeshua told us that we would have tribulation in this world. Now, I'm planning each week to give an example of how much favor we've received from the Lord in the process of obtaining our new building. It's easy to sit there and just bask in the glory, but we really need to remember all that the Lord has done for us. And while a lot of people have worked awfully hard to get us to where we are at this point, getting awfully close to a certificate of occupancy, uh, I'm hoping in another week or two maybe. Nonetheless, it's important for us to see how much favor we have received from the Lord in this process because I know as I relay these things to you, you are going to conclude that it is not about what we have done, that he is the one who is orchestrating this. Last week I talked about the bank's favor in agreeing to loan us the amount of money we needed to purchase the building. But the reality is this never would have been able to take place if we didn't have the rental income from the renters that are currently in the building. At first, we lamented. Uh, we wanted to use the whole building. We wanted to be able to build a 300-seat sanctuary, uh, which we may be able to do at some point. But it turns out we never would have been able to get that building in the first place if that space had not been rented out to those renters and we had that income as well. And so once again, we see the Lord's hand in, in this process. Something that we initially complained about ended up being a tremendous blessing to, to us in this process. We can also examine our own lives. How far have you come tonight? You know, the Sabbath gives us a weekly opportunity to take stock of all that the Lord has done for us. And many of us, when we look back on our lives, we see that the Lord has us where he needs us right now, meaning that everything that has happened beforehand, he was completely in control. He knows exactly what he's doing, and he has a plan for each one of us. He has given us different gifting, different callings, different experiences, but he has been able to bring each of us to where we need to be to serve him. You know, as we take stock, we'll see he's used us to bless others, perhaps in their time of need. We'll remember special times in our lives, such as sharing the gospel with someone. I actually uh, was sharing with a, uh, I mentioned this in our Tuesday class, that on Wednesday uh, I was uh, sharing um, the Jewishness of Messiah Yeshua with a 95-year-old uh, Jewish woman. Um, I probably shouldn't give her age because she said she would come to one of our services once we moved to the new building, which is another reason I'm excited about moving to the new building. And next week, I'm going to be sharing with a 98-year-old Jewish woman. Now, that sounds pretty old, but I've, or in, in several years ago, I shared with a 107-year-old Jewish woman. And the point is, yes, these women are towards the end of their stage of life, and it seems like, you know, wait a minute, is that all you share with? No, I shared with a 101-year-old Jewish man. And I've actually shared with younger people as well. But the fact that the Lord has preserved it, I mean, there, the, that group of people, um, except 95, I've known people who have lived beyond that. But the only people that I know personally who have lived beyond 99 are the three um, other people that I, that I shared with. So it's interesting that the Lord... Yeah, and um, in two of those cases, they never you know, heard about the Messiah, or one of those cases never heard about the Messiah before I, I shared with them. Um, and the other two, uh, they didn't understand Messianic Judaism in one case, and he was ready to uh, renounce his belief in Yeshua because, as he said it, I was born a Jew, I'll die a Jew. And so his daughters came to me and said, you know, can you speak to our father? And when I shared Messianic Judaism with him, he was completely at peace with the idea that he could believe in Yeshua as the Jewish Messiah, and therefore he would be born a Jew and he would die a Jew. 
and uh, he died at the age of, the young age of 102, uh, and, and I did said the Kaddish at, at his funeral. And so frequently we will see times as we take stock where the Lord has used us, and you may have similar stories, maybe not the people being quite that old, but, but similar type stories. And the reality is, it's not simply, you know, always sharing the gospel. Sometimes we just are there for a friend when they simply need a shoulder to cry on. However, as we take stock, we may also realize that other times we were more about pursuing our own agenda than seeking the Lord. Uh, you know, we can learn from the mistakes we've made in the past. But one of the things that we'll see, even with our mistakes, the Lord continues to bless. That he is faithful, even when we are faithless. That he is loving, even when we are difficult to love. Anybody out there difficult to love? Don't raise your hand. Okay. <clears throat> I'll raise up my hand for all of us. The children of Israel have been far from perfect in their journey. But because of God's faithfulness, they're, ma they're now making their final preparations to enter the land that the Lord had promised to their forefathers. And in the first 12 verses of Numbers 34, God tells Moses the borders of the land he's giving to the Israelites. And these borders include parts of modern-day Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and Egypt, some of which they still have never possessed. In Numbers 35, as we read earlier, the Lord provides instructions for the six cities of refuge out of the cities that will belong to the Levites as a place where someone who has killed another, and it's understandable that the family member would want revenge, uh, this gives them a safe place to stay until it's determined whether the killing was an accident uh, or self-defense or if it was in fact murder. Now, uh, I wanna talk about uh, the calendar, once again, um, we're uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks on the 9th of Av, the date of the destruction of the two temples. And normally, the portion from the prophets, first of all, I usually choose verses that are encouraging and positive, in particular regarding the Jewish people. Because usually after you read verse, verses of condemnation, if we keep reading, we find verses uh, where the Lord says that he will yet bless them. Um, but the rabbis selected the portions um, for this week and next week. It's actually three portions, two this week, one next week, that are intended to remind the Jewish people of why the Lord allowed the temples to be destroyed. So today we would say he is calling them out. Uh, if you were listening to what we read earlier. Um, the first Haftarah of affliction is Jeremiah 1, uh, 1 through 2, 3. And in verses 11 through 16 of Jeremiah 1, he is shown two visions by the Lord. And the first vision uh, is explained to him to be, to be about an almond tree branch. And it means that the Lord will hasten his word to perform. Don't ask me how all that ties together, but that's what it says. But in the second vision, Jeremiah sees a boiling cauldron emptying toward the south. And there again, it tells what the vision means. The Lord tells Jeremiah, this represents the judgment of Judah, the southern kingdom. Uh, he says they've offered incense to other gods and worshiped what their own hands have made. And in the second Haftarah of affliction, which begins in Jeremiah 2 verse 4, uh, the, a, a passage that leads to the verses we read earlier, we see the Lord's accusation against Israel continues. And he compares them unfavorably to their neighbors who worship gods of wood and stone and do not forsake their false gods. And he's saying to them, you've forsaken the one and only true God who actually can protect and bless you while the pagans refused to forsake gods they'd made with their own hands. So that's a real indictment against our people. And like I said, that is um, intended to uh, help them to understand why the Lord might have allowed the, the temples to be destroyed. But once again, if we keep reading, we find that God still desires that the people return to him. In Jeremiah 3, verses 14 and 15, the Lord says, return 
O backsliding children, declares the Lord, because I am your husband, and I will choose you, one from a city, two from a clan, and I will bring you to Zion. Zion. I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you knowledge and understanding. He has not given up on his people because he remains the faithful God of Israel. Do not believe anything else that anyone would tell you about God not fulfilling his promises that he has made. Because tonight we have seen that God is always faithful to his promises. He's restored us to the land that he promised to our ancestors. He preserves us as a remnant in the Messianic Jewish movement of today. And he blesses the Gentiles through the Jewish Messiah, just as he promised Abraham uh, that in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And one day he will return, as it says in Zechariah 14, to deliver our people from their enemies and then to rule as king from his throne. Where? Where? In Jerusalem. Now maybe tonight you've just realized that the Lord has displayed unconditional love towards you. As I mentioned earlier, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son as the sacrifice for our sins. And all you have to do to receive the sacrifice, to have the eternal life uh, that God has promised, is just to say yes as he calls you back to himself. And so I'd like to ask with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you want to accept Yeshua as your Messiah tonight, all you have to do is raise your hand and we'll say a prayer together. Just put your hand up and you can put it right back down. Is there anyone? We always give that opportunity. We never take for granted that everyone here has made that decision. And there may be somebody watching on video. And if you're raising your hand right now, um, <clears throat> We would like to talk with you, and so you can email us or uh, text us or contact us in some way, and we'll talk with you more about it. But perhaps um, as believers, there are other things that I mentioned tonight that uh, we are struggling with. Perhaps you bargained with the Lord. You made vows that you've totally forgotten about. You know, maybe it was Lord. Uh, you know, if you'll help me to pass this test, I'll do so and so. Um, or, or Lord, you know, if you'll bless me in some way, uh, you, you can ask him to show you. Um, and, and if he shows you that you've been unfaithful in some area, um, that's an opportunity to get right in that area with him. You know, perhaps people uh, are unable to rely on what you've said in the past, your yes didn't really mean yes. Your no didn't mean no. You know, we even talk about my fingers were crossed. Uh, at least we did in elementary school. Hopefully not too much later after that. <coughs> Maybe you've been struggling with trusting in the Lord. But when you look back, you realize he's been orchestrating the circumstances in your life all along. So you can ask him to enable you to trust him more for blessing and to sustain you during the challenging times. Or maybe you realize now that loving unconditionally uh, is something that we're supposed to do because as we love unconditionally, we better understand the unconditional love that our God had for us. Maybe you found it all too easy to love those who love you and hate those who oppose you. You know, I, I think it's a challenge for us all. And the reality is God was just saying that our love is able to overcome hate is able to overcome the selfishness of the flesh. And so we can ask him to help us to do a better job of loving unconditionally. And I would just ask you at this time, if the Lord has shown you uh, one of those areas where he wants to make change or even some other area, just that you would join with me in this prayer as Lord, we desire a closer walk with you. We desire to do a better job of living according to your truths. We desire to trust you more, Lord, as we praise you, as we realize how you have had your hand on us at times when we didn't even realize it. Uh, it's kind of like that uh, poem, The, the Footprints. And, and so, Lord, we thank you for your love, your unconditional love. And, Lord, we ask you to help us to love others in that same way, that we might better understand 
the love you have for us. Help us to overcome our fleshly ways, our selfishness, as, Lord, we desire to bring glory to you. And we look forward uh, to all the blessings uh, that you are able to bring into our lives in the days ahead. And we ask these things in our Messiah, Yeshua's name. And everyone said, amen, amen and amen. Now we're going to continue our service as I call our cantor back up to perform the blessings that are traditionally recited at the end of the service, the Kiddush and the Hamotzi, the blessing over the fruit of the vine and the bread, uh, followed by a benediction and our closing song. Uh, thanks to all who had a part in our service tonight. Thank you all for coming. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Amen. L'chaim. And we say L'chaim, which means to life, because uh, the Lord tells us to choose life and choose blessing. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread and all manner of food from earth. Amen. Remember our work day at the new building this Sunday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And uh, now we are going to pronounce the blessing found in Numbers chapter 6. These are actually the Lord's words of blessing that he instructed. The first Kohen Gadol, the first high priest, Aharon, Aaron, uh, to pronounce these words of blessing uh, over his people. And so we encourage you to stand and receive these words of blessing from the Lord this evening. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord calls his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, and may he grant unto you his peace. Amen. I mentioned the new building. Uh, like I said, we're hoping to get the certificate of occupancy maybe by the middle of August, and then um, to be able to move uh, such that we would be holding services in the new building uh, sometime probably September, but I'm going to pray that um, maybe even sooner, maybe before August is out. Um, <clears throat> now we're going to have our closing song. It's the Ein Kelohenu. It means there is no one like our God. And we'll sing it in the Hebrew just like I did in the synagogue growing up, but then we're going to sing the Eng uh, an English translation so you'll know what you just sung. The Ein Kelohenu. Ain Kalahenu, Ain Kadonenu, Ain Kamahenu, Ain Kamoshienu, Me Kalahenu, Me Kadonenu, Me Kamahenu, Me Kamoshienu, There is no one like our God, there is no one like our Lord, there is no one like our King, there is no one like Messiah, who is like our God, who is like our Lord, who is like our King, who is like our Messiah. We give thanks to our God, we give thanks to our Lord, we give thanks to our King, we give thanks to our Messiah. 
Blessed be our God, blessed be our Lord, blessed be our King, blessed be our Messiah. You are the one our God, you are the one our Lord, you are the one our King, you are the one our Messiah. Amen and amen. God bless you all. Enjoy the time of fellowship. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.